Welcome everybody to the uh, uh, CAM Colloquium and in particular to the Notable Alumni uh, series of the CAM Colloquium. Um, and I'm pleased that uh, we were able to uh, finally schedule uh, Erica Tatiana Camacho uh, for our colloquium today. So uh, Erica Camacho is a mathematical biologist who graduated from CAM in 2003. Uh, with a PhD dissertation on mathematical models of retinal dynamics that uh, Richard Rand supervised. Um, after graduating from CAM, she spent a year as a postdoc at uh, Los Alamos uh, and then um, was a faculty member at Loyola Marymount until 2007. Um, and since 2007, she's been a faculty member at uh, Arizona State University where she's currently a full professor in applied mathematics. Um, she's continued to work on mathematical modeling uh, of eyes and vision since, um, and has published the first set of mechanistic models about uh, photoreceptor degeneration, so which is fairly important for understanding blindness. Um, but in addition to her technical work, she's equally well known for her work on creating educational opportunities for individuals from marginalized communities. And she's doing this now as an NSF programmer director for the Advance and HSI programs. So for those who don't know, NSF speak advances organizational change for gender equity in STEM academic professions. Um, and HSI is short for Hispanic serving institutions. Um, but this is only the latest step in a fairly well-recognized trajectory of leadership and scholarship and mentoring uh, for which she's won numerous awards. Uh, so her bio mentioned several of these, uh, a AAAS Mentor Award, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Math, and Engineering Mentoring, um, the AWM Louis Hayes Award, uh, and a few others. And I will mention one that is not in the bio yet, uh, which the CAM students will have seen in the Friday notes from the start of April, uh, which is when I found out about it, which is the 2020 SACNAS uh, Presidential Service Award. Um, so as a logistical reminder, uh, this talk is being recorded. Um, we ask you to make sure your microphone is muted, uh, but please do feel free to leave your, leave your video on. Um, if you want to ask a question during the presentation, you can use the hand raise and I'll keep an eye on it. Uh, I'll call you when there's a pause, unless Erica would prefer to allow attendees to jump up, in which case uh, I will allow her to say so. And with that, thank you, Professor Camacho, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here. I'm really excited. I don't think I've ever been this nervous in a talk, so hopefully I'll do great or I'll do okay. Um, and let me just share my screen so that uh, we could get started. So um, without any further ado, I decided to change the title of my talk and also my talk a little bit just to give a little bit of overview of what has been done. So I will give you an overview of the different um, models that have been out there to try to mitigate blindness. Um, so, the motivation for this work, according to the uh, World Health Organization, there is an estimated at least 2.2 2 million people that have vision impairment or blindness. In most cases, is due to either cataract or cataracts or glaucoma, which is one of the biggest uh, influence of vision impairment. But mainly, that is due to economics and lack of access to health uh, that happens in many of uh, third world third world countries. But in well developed countries. Blindness is mainly led by photoreceptor degeneration. Uh, and there is no cure for photoreceptor degeneration. There's currently a, a different studies, including a, um, a retina chip that goes into the eye to try to absorb the different photons that come in and to allow individuals to see. Yeah, but uh, there's not, there's not a, a definite cure cur currently for photoreceptor degeneration. And that's where my work comes in and the main, um, different things that lead to photoreceptor degeneration is untreated retinal detachment or age-related macular degeneration. That's one of the leading causes of vision um, for people that are older, 50 years or older, and accounts for uh, eight, about 8.7% 8 of blindness. And then with the rise of uh, diabetics, uh, diabetic retinopathic is another uh, influence of photoreceptor degeneration. And then there's also uh, retinitis pigmentosa, which is the leading cause of inherited blindness. 
affecting 1.5 million people. And my work may focus on retinitis pigmentosa and uh, related macular degeneration. And that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about. So um, just to understand a little bit, what do we mean by uh, degeneration? Well, in terms of uh, age-related macular degeneration or AMD, primarily affects the fovea, which is the central vision of the macula, containing mainly the cone photoreceptors. The cones are responsible for acuity and color vision, while the rods are responsible for night vision and peripheral vision. And then uh, in retinitis pigmentosa, that is typically characterized by a sequential degeneration where the rods carry the uh, mutated gene that is the cause of the disease. However, the cones who are perfectly healthy also die. And usually we see a first wave of death of the rods and then followed by the cones. And in some cases we see uh, what is called reverse RP or reverse retinitis pigmentosa. We see that happening simultaneously. And in photoreceptors, one of the things is by the, when you reach in the human, when you reach the age of five, about, about five years old, you have already a mature retina. And in that case, there is no spontaneous birth of photoreceptors. The ones that you have, that's all you have. So how do the photoreceptors maintain their vitality? Is by renewing and shedding their outer segments. And uh, the outer segments are just packed disc of photopigments. But uh, so a lot of uh, different accumulated uh, debris that is there is uh, get rid of through shedding of the photo uh, of the outer segments where they get phagocytosis by the retinal pigment epithelium. And that's to prevent toxicity and other uh, accumulated photooxidative products that accumulate. So here's just the diagram in the bottom. Uh, one is showing here where the, where the photoreceptors are, the rods and the cones. And when they start to degenerate, they start to, their outer segment uh, starts to get shorter and shorter. And eventually they, they, they have only the inner segments and they start, and then they disappear. And usually uh, the outer segments are on the outer nuclear layer and here you see a healthy uh, control retina, and here you, in the in the right you see a diseased um, retina, where you see those uh, those the, those patches that show that uh, the uh, outer nuclear layer uh, parts of the outer segments have, are not there anymore. So that's how we could uh, we start to characterize uh, vis uh, visually when they start to degenerate. Now uh, to start to understand the how the mechanisms that are that allow for receptors to kind of um, stay uh, alive longer and maintain their vitality, we uh, created a me mechanistic model. The first mechanistic model was just to understand the rod con uh, interactions and mainly to understand why is it that in retinitis pigmentosa, where the cones are perfectly healthy, they also degenerate. What is the interaction between the rods and the cones? So uh, there was, we created the first model to try to understand that. And that model allows us to investigate the fundamental mechanisms that might link the degeneration of healthy cones. But most important, it allows us to identify the direct connection between the rods and the cones before it was even discovered experimentally. But we couldn't publish until it actually was discovered. And then we could actually coin the term that, uh, which I'm gonna talk about um, that actually allowed for that. And then it allowed also to confirm that there is no spontaneous uh, regenerations of cones and rods. And we were also able to test the cases where you, if you're born with um, our cones, which means you're colorblind, you stay in that invariant plane, as well as if you're born with no rods, uh, no night vision, you stay in that invariant plane. Or you never, you cannot gain that kind of sight. So um, in, that, in that case of that healthy cone, we are able to see different uh, three different equilibrium, and that equilibrium is able to uh, give, give interpretation to the different physiological stages. You know, in one case where there's nothing, uh, you don't have the you don't have the rods, the cones, or the retinal pigment epithelium that mediates the nutrients coming uh, to the to the photoreceptors, or in another case where you do have you do have um, the retinal pigment epithelium, but you don't have the photoreceptors, so you have complete blindness. And uh, in the case where you have an immature retina, no cones or the case where you have no, no rods and where you have everything present. But most important, what it allowed to it identify three qu key quantities that came in later models that actually were uh, disease models or they had other uh, elements. And one of them was the nutrient carrying capacity. The other ones was, was the energy consumption of the cones to the energy uptake. And another one uh, was the energy consumption to the energy uptake of the of the rod. So those uh, three quantities, we'll see them over and over again. And I wanna say that uh, mu sub i represents the energy consumption 
that is included in shedding of the outer segments as well as the associated metabolism. And a, a sub I represents the uptake in the associated, associated met metabolism as well. And it also quantifies the uh, aerobic glycolysis, the, uh, the, 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 the metabolism driven by glucose and then uh, and the renewal as well. So with that, with that in mind, then we, we're looking at going back to the earlier motivation uh, so what are for uh, understanding photoreceptor degeneration in disease cases, in particular in retinitis pigmentosa. We wanted to consider a model that really looked at the disease case. And for this, we actually divided the, the raw population based on their phenotype between those that um, had the mutation and those that didn't. And we assumed that RP had already uh, begun, that um, we didn't look at what is specific mutations lead to it. So we just have one now, one more equation that includes the mutated uh, rods, and uh, in there, in blue, is the new uh, the new terms that come into play. We know the mutated rods experimentally has shown that they also are able to, to synthesize that protein that actually is the direct connection between the rods and the cones. So we were able to do that, and mainly we want to understand the secondary wave uh, death wave of the cones. So uh, in the disease case, we're able to see now seven equilibria, right? And those seven equilibria allow us to actually characterize the different stages of retinitis pigmentosa and also that subtype. So in retinitis pigmentosa, we have the, the typical type, which is the, the um, raw cone RP or retinitis pigmentosa, which means that the rods die first then the cones, or we also have the reverse retinitis pigmentosa in which they could die simultaneously or sometimes the cones actually die first and uh, they disappear first and then the, and then the rods. And, uh, and then as you see, we have the different quantities that appear. So with that model, we were able to actually look at different um, path, uh, uh, phenomenological patients, if you uh, so to speak. And we consider two different patients, right? They had many other parameters the same, except for the, the energy consumption to energy uptake uh, ratio, which is B sub C. They just, that's the only quantity they have different. And we say, well, how about we consider uh, path one where they go from having everything, where they have sight, E7, all the way to complete blindness. And here we have a, a parameter uh, plane where we're looking at the different stability regions of uh, equilibria. And if you notice for path one, in one case, we go from everything to complete blindness. In another case, you go from uh, having everything to the E6, where is where you are in st second stage of reverse RP, and then you go to blindness. And I should say that retinitis pigmentosa the rate in which you go from uh, when you first have the, 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 the mutation to where you go to complete blindness, it varies dramatically. The progression, as well as how the disease manifests, it varies dramatically, even in individuals within the same family. So uh, that's something that makes it a little bit more complicated. And there's about 16 um, mutations that lead to retinitis pigmentosa. And those are the ones that are only associated with the eye, not with any other organs. So if you also look at the path two, uh, right, you could see that the, the stages that lead to complete blindness are the same. We go to, from E7 to E5 to E3 to E2. However, the region is a little bit of E3 for one of the patients is much larger, which allows us to have more flexibility on the mechanisms or the parameters that define those mechanisms to be able to then perturb them to, or, or change them to be able to try to uh, stay in that region and, and halt blindness that way. And we were able to do that as well with um, with uh, the cone rod RP, right? So here's another example, but really going into from uh, com complete sight to blindness could take different pathways, right? So you, and, and it depends on these key quantities that we've talked about the nutrient carrying capacity and the energy consumption and, and energy uptake of both the rods and the cones. And here we are looking just at the mutated uh, rods. So, um, one of the things that experimentally was known is that even after all the rods have died, when we're almost at the tail end of the first death wave of um, retinitis pigmentosa, then that's when the cones start to die. And experimentally, they were able to show that even when you have 5% of your cones remaining, you're able to save sight, right? And this is in mice experiments. So we asked ourselves, are we able to do that in our models? And I just said that one of, the, uh, one of the ways that we're able to, see, to save sight was through the rod-derived combinability factor, which is the link 
the direct connection from the cones to the rods. That that's the reason why if the rods begin to die besides to, uh, toxicity that is due to uh, oxygen, right? Or hypoxia conditions is RDCBF also the reasons why the cones that are healthy start to die. And that's because RDCBF, which is a family of proteins and functions that protect against oxidative stress, also allows for the acceleration of glucose, which is very important under stressful conditions, under uh, glucose deprived conditions. So uh, that's one of the, so one of the things, like I said, in the lab, they were able to test that you could still save sight when, even when 95% of your cones, cones are gone in the secondary way death, but they were also able to, to observe that there was a rescue effect between 20% to 40%. And so we asked, can we do that with our model? And to do that, we did an optimal control model where we now, what we do is we, we have an introvert retro uh, administration of RDCBF, and that comes into play here in you. And uh, Sigma represent the effectiveness of the RDCBF treatment in the disease model. And what we're able to see, we are able to see, and this is an, uh, using um, parameters that are co coincide with uh, experimental data of a mice. And we see that after 14 days, we are able to do have a rescue effect. And that, that, that is the blue curve. And the red curve is no control, the red dash curve. And we have a 40% uh, rescue effect. However, we see that there's a slightly, uh, that if we look at the trophic pool or the re retinal pigment epithelium, cells, that there's a decrease in it. And that is all related to glycolysis and how it works and how glucose sometimes is utilized by the retinal pigment epithelium, especially during stressful conditions. So, and then the question comes, is there any other type of neurotrophic factor that could actually have a similar effect or even a, a more magnified effect? So we look at MAM which is the neuroprotective uh, factor. But this one is one that actually uh, protects against uh, uh, apoptosis. And it works for, all, for the rods as well as the cones and as well as the uh, mutated rods. So we went ahead and, and, and did an optimal control model where we actually put uh, the control representing MAM. And, and again, we got the parameters from experimental data and we were able to actually match that data and have a 65% rescue effect. And here we see it for the, they didn't separate it between the mutated and the, uh, the uh, non-mutated rods or the, based on the phenotype. So we just had to add them together. But you see here in the blue curve with control and the red dash curve without control and of the cones as well and the impact. And in there we see that uh, the retinal pigment epithelium cells, the, it's just the curves right above one another. So Erica, there's a question from Alex Vladimirsky about what the criterion is for the optimal control problem. In terms of uh, what cri right criteria, Alex? What the, I think what the objective is. What is the running cost and what is the terminal cost you, you're using to define? Yeah, the function you're saying to yeah. define the U. So the U is just, the control is just a linear function and the objective integral was just, it was just uh, U square times an actual uh, epsilon where epsilon was just to bring together the, to make sure that the quantities were uh, pretty much in the similar kind of scale. Is that what the question is? Uh, I, I still don't understand. I sort of expected to, to see R variable participating in the running cost or in, in the terminal cost. The terminal um, cost. You, you, if I understood you correctly, you're penalizing for the amount of U administered. Well, yeah, there, you're saying like there's some toxicity going on for U administer. Right. Is that what you, so in, uh, and in terms of uh, what is the what is the penalty? Are you are you you're looking for u of t, which will minimize some integral? Uh, what is it an integral of? Oh, is the integral like I said, is the integral of epsilon u square right minus uh, um, is it's going to be uh, the the r uh, plus r sub uh, r sub n plus r m plus c. And each of them have an actual uh, alpha, which is a weight factor in terms of which one is the one that we want to uh, put the biggest weight on to try to uh, optimize. I see. Thank you very much for clarifying. I hope I answered that question. So, so in terms of, uh, so the results show that uh, 
that uh, confront the, the key role of glucose and trophic factors for con vitality, but also to extend their lifespan as well. And the rods and cones are the most metabolic, since we know that rods and cones are the most metabolic cells, they require significant glucose as well as oxygen. And in retinitis pigmentosa, and when we see photoreceptor degeneration, one of the things that we start to see is a lot of uh, oxygen accumulate. In retinitis pigmentosa in particular, as the rods die, oxygen starts to accumulate and it gets to a point that ultimately the cones cannot take that. So they succumb in, right? And this was also shown by uh, Paul Roberts and his team in 2017 and 2018, where they use a PDE model. They looked at the photoreceptor dis distribution, the human retina, to model oxygen toxicity in RP in, in human. And they're so captured the different patterns of cell death in certain regions, not in all the regions, but in certain of, in certain of the regions. And they concluded that antioxidant and trophic factor treatments have a potential to reduce a uh, hyperoxia-induced disease and confirm things that had already been known experimentally, but as well as uh, the modeling approach in terms of looking at RDCDF, um, which was something that we had been looking at. So then the question is, why would glucose prolong life in some cases and reverse degeneration even in the hyperoxic environment, right? So now we have to take a step back and especially prolong life. So in our model, we were able to see looking at data um, um, are, um, that in here we have cell count and we're able to see that um, and so in, in, in the red and the blue is really simulations of our, of our model that fit the data. And, but here in the pink curve is where you, uh, we extend the life of the cones or with experimentally and we did the same thing by varying our parameters and we're able to also capture the, the two waves. The, the black one is the death wave of the, of the rods and the, uh, and the red one is of the cones. And here we see that we could actually extend it, right? And here we're looking at our uh, PRC data. And uh, we, have to, we have to normalize uh, in order to be everything between zero and one so that we could be able to compare it to the data. But we're able to see that, that that in fact has this thing in prolonging the life. So what are the things that are leading to that? So we look, we look deeper in terms of the, the different um, quantities that we we're looking at to try to better understand it. And here we're looking at uh, the carrying capacity quantity, DT. And we look at the day, zero day and also day five, which is where the rods start to die. And then we look at a day 24.1, which is where all the rods are completely dead. And uh, just to kind of measure it, if you see here, you see this little dot here, that's where it happens. And that's where we see the cone starting to take off and die. And we see that up, uh, at day 24 and after that, the uh, ratio of energy consumption to energy uptake of the cones is really changing only by 1%. The one that is changing the most is the um, nutrient carrying capacity. That's the one that is really driving this last cone and we're able, and that's really what is responsible for being able to extend it as well. So there's something about the nutrients that is really impacting. So we need to take a little bit of a step, uh, zoom in, like, and we recognizing that and understanding RDCBF as well as reactive oxidative, oxidative species and also the long form of RDCBF and see what are their roles in the different aspects. So we have RDCBF that is being synthesized by the rods and that binds to uh, BCG, creates a complex, binds to the cell, um, uh, the, the, uh, the cell boundary that, and that allows glucose to be accelerated. That glucose is the one that actually accelerates and starts the aerobic glycolysis process. But in that process, there's also oxidative, uh, reactive oxidative species, ROS being created. That is being, and one in, in, in the glycolysis process, one of the things is for it to also go up to uh, the Kennedy pathway to create GP3, which is a precursor of lipid synthesis and creation of outer segment disc. But it also, uh, there's also a, a diversion into the Pintos pathways to where, where NADPH is. And that allows for the mechanism that would allow uh, RDCBFL to be reduced and that has been implicated in actually being protecting um, the cones against ROS, uh, reactive oxidative species. And that, and both the cones and the, and the ROS synthesize RDCBFL. So now that we have a bigger understanding, we could go and try to uh, 
understand better, for example, how does RDCBF promote bone survival, right? So now we're gonna actually zoom in and look at this aerobic glycolysis process and try to understand it a little bit better. And now that we have that better understanding, uh, we're gonna model the uptake of glucose much better. And one of the things that we know is that RDCB acts as an allosteric reg regulator of GLUT1 by triggering its 3 amorization. And that means that there's a binding time requirement in which the binding of RDCBF molecules to the cone for receptor requires a certain amount of time to bind and accelerate the glucose uptake. But there's also exhibit an affinity or a learning curve, right? That um, you lose a certain threshold of RDCBF, that, that, they will, that they will not utilize RDCBF efficiently and in order to be able to accelerate glucose uptake. And above a certain threshold, it would actually be accelerated up to a saturation level of Bmax. And Bmax is the maximum velocity of the kinetic reaction. So it creates this sigmoidal fun function that we will make use of because then that suggests that there's a whole type three res response function to appropriately model the rate of uh, formation of the homotremic GLUT1 as a function of RDCBF. So this is, we model the uptake of glucose due to RDCBF by this function. And then uh, the rate of glucose transport in the function we know is a gradient of the concentration of glucose outside of the cell, which is capital G, and inside of the cell, which is little g, and the rate of formation of uh, the tetratrimic GLUT1. So, and there's also this, uh, the natural glucose uptake that happens in the absence of RDCBF, and that's P. So that's how we're now gonna model the, the glucose uptake in the cone. So, but we're also gonna now take a, 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 we're gonna look at things at two scales. We're gonna look at the cellular level and we're gonna look at the molecular level. So we're gonna uh, look at how, you know, from the beginning, uh, the synthesis of RDCBF by the rods, the glucose is triggered. And we're gonna be looking at the metabolites that are in the uh, boxes. We're gonna look at uh, glucose, G6P, NADPH, F16 bisphosphate, which is F16BP, and then Peruve, and as well as ROS and GP3, which is the precursor of lipids. And we got in the cellular level, we're going to look both at the, uh, the, the trophic uh, pool, which is uh, again mediated by the retinal pigment epithelium, and we're going to be looking at the rods and the cones. And this picture is supposed to have the cones here, but it kind of got a little messed up. So, so that's what we're going to look. And in that case, um, we have at the molecular level, we have uh, eight uh, metabolites that we're looking at, concentrations of metabolites. So we have uh, eight equations. And in the cellular level, we have uh, just our, our three equations of the rods, cones, and trophic pool, where we're looking at the sum of the proportion of pool lengths within each outer segment. And here's just a uh, schematic so you could see it better where the things um, interact. And then we have the different chemical reactions associated with every uh, metabolite getting created, as well as the reaction rates uh, for each of them. And then, uh, so that together gives us an uh, six, uh, 11 equation, ordinary equation model. I should say that in terms of uh, modeling the diversion between going down the uh, aerobic glycolysis pathway and the pintos pathway, we do that uh, with, the with the functions that are here below. Um, uh, looking at omega and, and kappa phi. And we do that by considering the accumulation of PEP. And PEP, uh, it is um, back to the here. I know I don't have it here. I thought I had it defined. Where did I define it? Well, here it is. It's a switch that uh, re re redirects the glucose to the pink pathway. And it's really the phosphophenone peruvid so that the PEP. I know. I'm, so in there we have that, and that is to kind of allow where, where things could go, but we don't have PP in our variables. So we have to use Peruve as a proxy to say there's enough PP accumulated. So things need to get diverted back. There's gonna be this feedback mechanism to send it back or to divert things, not send it back, but divert things down to the Pintos pathway. And here we have our uh, parameters. There's 24 parameters that we have with our system. And so, we try to demonstrate the pres presence of circadian rhythm in the sh in the in the in terms of the shedding and the renewal, right? The renewal of the outer segments are constantly being renewed, but the shedding happens mainly at uh, uh, at the uh, dawn, and that's where they, they lose about ten percent of the outer segments. So we try to see if there is that circadian rhythm in our model, and we compare it to experimental data of RDCBF 
and RDCBFL expression. Uh, RDCBF is used for the rods since only the rods express RDCBF. And then for the RDCBFL, we use the one that is expressed by the cones. And that's something that we have in here. And we, and we normalize again, our, our, we normalize our, uh, the data as well as the model output to be able to compare them. And then, uh, so in this model, we actually also look at the sensitivity. We try, uh, we do a, a sensitivity analysis using Latin hyperfuse sampling. And that's to be able to see which are the parameters that define different processes that impact the output that most. And we look at when everything is working properly. We also look at the case where there is insufficient glucose, I mean, insufficient RDCBF, when there's no RDCBF, and when glucose is not being used efficiently by the cells. And this is just an example. Uh, we um, here we have um, we are like we're looking at the sensitivity analysis, and this is at day 14. We looked at at different uh, time points as well. Uh, we looked at uh, the 60 minutes, uh, one day, 24, uh, seven days, and 14 days. And here we're looking at 14 days, and we see that uh, the the different variables that impact the system, and one of them is uh, the V acts associated with the catalytic reaction of Peruve. And we see that, that if we increase um, that parameter, that will lead to an a decrease in the output of the cone. And in, um, and in particular, that could be explained because remember, uh, so if the Bmax is increased, that would accelerate the, the production of our, uh, Peruve. But also if there's more Peruve, we're using that as a proxy to measure the accumulation of PEP, which comes next in the catalytic uh, sequential reactions. And so that would actually send a signal in the model to, for the, for the um, process to be diverted into the Pintos pathway. So right at G6P, things would be diverted into the Pintos pathway. And that would lead to uh, eventually a decrease of glucose because things are not going into the Kennedy pathway where, where to contribute to GP3, which is contributing to the lipid production um, in the outer segments. We also see here that, that Q, right, which is right here in, in green, that if we increase Q, that we're actually gonna increase the overall outer segments for the cones, right? And, and Q in our system is the proportion of F16 bisphosphate used to in the production of GP3. So if there's more of that uh, going into GP3, there's gonna be more GP3, GP3 is the precursor of the lipid production. So that's gonna to lead to more outer segments. So that, is, uh, so that will increase that. And we see other, other parameters that are also being, um, that a change in them will affect the overall output. So now um, this is like, again, for all uh, pro uh, process working properly, we like, so we look at different time points and we looked at what are the processes that are being affected. And here we kind of depicted that with green for the ones that are, uh, they were sensitive but had a, a negative PRC value and red white for the ones that have a positive PRC value. And the PRC value that we took, it was absolute value being less than 0 0.4, I should say. And we see that um, the cones are not sensitive to RDCBF, which is the delta parameter. And that uh, we maintain the ratio of rods to cones, which is 20 to one. And also that the more or less the cone outer segment population uh, is maintained, the overall, and that the three processes that are affected are glycolysis, which is the process that we see here coming down, as well as the outer segment renewal, and uh, which is the measured by GP3, and the competition for resources, which is really measuring by the things that are being pulled out from the trophic pool, right? And we see that in the different in the different stages. Like I said, we did different cases as well. I'm not gonna show all of them, but I'm just gonna highlight the different uh, things that uh, affect. And what we see is that in the presence of RDCBF, the three set of processes that contribute to cone vitality are affected. When RDCBF is low or there's no RDCBF, there, it only depends on two processes and that's the cones outer segment renewal and the competition for resources. And, and then glucose uptake diminishes significant and cone outer segment production cannot be maintained we see that when RDCBF is zero, when we don't have it. And here's the different cases that we did and what we ultimately, which are the processes that are affected. One of the things that uh, was very interesting is to see that in all cases, except when there's insufficient RDCBF, the cones are not sensitive to RDCBF. So they're only sensitive when there's insufficient RDCBF. In other words, under stressful conditions, that's when RDCBF really matters the most. 
Otherwise, it doesn't really impact in, in this model. So then that, that uh, allows us to say, well, what happens if we reduce IDCBF by 40% from already the insufficient levels? If we take the insufficient levels to be the base case and we, we reduce it by 40%, and then we, we let the system run and we measure it at 14 days. What do we see? What are the changes that we see? So blue is if we take the uh, baseline of um, uh, 40 um, of the insufficient case, the outputs, right? And then we see that that uh, all the processes are affected and ADPH is extremely affected. We see that rods and trophic pool are not affected, but we would expect that because IVCBF does not uh, impact rods or the trophic pool that impacts the cones. However, we see that GP3 is not really affected. So we ask, what is it about RDCVF that is so, like in this process, the way we model it, that is actually, is there something that we're missing? What is, what are the things that are, are in, that are embedded in there that is so important for the cell, right? So that allows us to take a step back and say, let's consider again a single cone, but we are going to now um, focus, uh, take away some of the metabolites that we're looking at and focus really on how is really, um, what's happening with GP3. In other words, a GP3 that leads to this lipid synthesis and production of outer segments, right? So this part here, and also what other metabolites or intermediate metabolites are coming in to help uh, create ATP, create maintain the cell, right? During uh, stressful conditions or glucose deplied condi conditions. And also is there a role with external lock that, that comes in to help? So we consider that case and, um, so now we, we, we take, uh, like I said, if we look at the glycolysis process, we're only including glucose and pyruvate. And then we look at the, uh, the Kennedy pathway, we still have the GP3 and we still have lactate, but now we add acetylcholate and SID just to, and with uh, GP3, we also consider the case in which uh, the shed outer segments, they, they produce these fatty acids that are oxidized. And then those ones become uh, beta hydropurates that actually are used as intermediate metabolites to feed the system and uh, help in the production of acetylcholate. And that's something that we will be considering. Um, so that's alpha, right? And then, but we also, since we're only look at considering the cones, we need to have a way of somehow use, having a proxy for the RDCBF that is synthesized by the rods that helps and facilitates the glucose acceleration. So we consider uh, GP3 and the understanding of the 20 to one ratio that they're, uh, in terms of the rods to cones to be able to use that to uh, model uh, the, the, a system from the rods in synthesizing RBCBF. We also, uh, in terms of lactate, we consider a gating function that will not allow lactate to go back into the, into the cell once it's out in the, external, uh, in the external space of the matrix of the cell. In order to, and we also can, and that, and we also consider that external lactate coming in as the intermediate metabolite to help acetylcholate in the oxidative phosphorylation stage. And and with that, like so, we have different uh, um, pathways in this model. And within that model, we have only uh, six differential equations, right? And uh, in, in and modeling the different um, metabolite production and kinetics that happen, but in a simplified uh, way, and we have a little less parameters. And then, um, so the goal for here is to really determine which process have the greatest impact in the metabolic system, right? And we're gonna look at uh, um, the Latin hyper-Q sampling using uh, partial correlation coefficients, as well as the stereophoria amplitude sensitivity test to be able to uh, understand the impact of the parameters in the output, the partial correlation coefficient reveals how the output of the model is affected by the parameter inputs. And the EFAS or the uh, standard uh, Fourier amplitude sensitivity is a variant based method that measures how the parameters uncertainty uh, has the impact in the output variability. And we're gonna, and we're gonna be looking at the first index of the EFAS. And the ones with a larger index will have the most impact, obviously. So here we're just, and we looked at all the metabolites, but here we're just gonna look at GP3. And uh, what we see is that, um, and we consider two cases. We consider a case where there's very low uh, uh, initial 
glucose, internal glucose, and where there's a, a little higher uh, glucose, initial internal glucose. And that's the bottom pictures. And in the, in the left, we have uh, the results from uh, PRCC. And in the right, we have the results from EFAST. And what we see is in here that we, we what we have is that we we see that in the in the top picture here on the left we see that the things that are more significant if you see here there's a brown and a green curve and if you look at that the brown curve is the external glucose and the green curve is really the uh, and I could really see but I think it's the alpha no not the alpha is the actual um, K is a, is a, is a, is one of the K factors but um, and then we see that we also have the, the Q, which is the proportion that gets diverted to the Kennedy pathway being having an impact, but that initially, but then after that, that not as much. And then what we see here is the blue curve and that's the, uh, the alpha, which is really the, um, the uh, fatty acid oxidation that get converted to uh, beta uh, hydropurex and come in to help to uh, assist in uh, glucose deprived condition they come in to help in the production of acetylcholate. And that's the blue curve that we see here. We see that blue curve, the same here where, where we have higher glucose levels, right? And we still, and, and the other ones are, there's a few that are still impacting, but not as much. In the EFAS, in terms of uh, the uncertainty in the parameters, inputs that lead to uh, variability in the outputs, we still see this blue curve here having the greatest impact. And again, that is the, the alpha parameter, which measures the oxidation of fatty acids, they contribute to a beta hydropurates and then to um, ultimately help the production of acetylcholate. So we, so now we we do a little bit of bifurcation analysis to understand things a little bit more. So we look at uh, glucose uh, with respect to uh, alpha and also GP3 with respect to alpha. And one of the things, and we do that for different values of external glucose. And here we have a, what we have is a two saturnal bifurcations connected to each other or two curves. Here we have this, the blue one is a stable uh, state where we have a healthy state. And the green one that you see at the bottom is a stable pathological state. And the green and the red curve is unstable. And we see that as we, that for higher levels of external glucose, we have a, uh, we, we, uh, we are able to have a higher alpha that allows for us to achieve that uh, that stable, healthy state. For GP3, if you're looking at for very high alpha levels, or I guess for very small alpha levels, actually, it doesn't matter what the external glucose is, right? It doesn't really matter, and that's something interesting. We also we look at the st different stability regions, right, in terms of the healthy state only, the by stability region and the pathological state, and um, we see that. To be in the healthy state, right? It is a combination of having having a higher glucose level, but also lower alpha levels. And like I said, uh, and and la alpha is really uh, coming into a system in in um, in glucose deprived deprived conditions. So as we uh, we also what we do is we vary the value of lambda, and lambda is really the 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 factor is a uh, is really the the transport the transport conversion factor, and that measures the permeability of the cell. To allow uh, to bring glucose in, and we see that for higher levels, which is the green curves here, that shifts shifts that uh, regions and allow and makes the region for a healthy state much bigger. Right, it allows us to have a much uh, bigger region for that healthy state as we shift that those levels. So, um, in summary, what do we learn from the single model? Right, what we learn is that the model analysis classified external glucose. And, and as well as external lactin, you didn't see that, but that was for very for other uh, metabolites, as well as the oxidation of fatty acids, as having a high impact in the output in the different metabolites. We also see that the, uh, that there's um, this feedback mechanism, and because we saw the role that alpha play, then we really need to look into unpacking that parameter. All the different uh, processes that is being that are that is uh, that are being aggregated in there really need to be unpacked. But in order to unpack that, we really need to include another uh, cell type, which is the retinal pigment epithelium, and include also the shedding and the phagocytosis by the retinal pigment epithelium to really be able to model it appropriately. So that's where the further work in this direction is going. And we have submitted this work for publication. But 
Now, RDCBFL. RDCBFL, like I said, has been implicated in helping reduce ROS, reactive oxidative species, and helping maintain the cell vitality. How do we incorporate that into our model in the healthy case? And uh, in here, uh, this is work that has been done with my, uh, with, uh, my graduate student, um, Katie Winfett, and um, has been submitted and has been published. And here what we do, we incorporate RBCB alpha, uh, here with alpha sub R for the ROS and alpha sub C for the cones. And then the level of uh, reactive oxidative species is quantified by B sub one and B sub two. And I should say that the, lo the lower the B sub one and B sub two, that means the higher the level of ROS in the respective cells. So we, we use that to uh, try to, to model it. And we look now, we're, we're using the NXNL1 gene as a proxy for measurement of RDCBFL. I should say that the NXL1 gene is actually the gene responsible for the synthesis of RDCBF and RDCBFL. And here we have the case where we have a, either the gene knockout or the gene is there in black and in orange is when it's knockout. And here in this, uh, in this uh, left-hand side uh, picture, we have no light damage. Here in the, in the right side picture, we have light damage and we're looking at the outer nuclear layer of thickness, which is what measures the outer segment, um, the outer segment of the photoreceptors. And, th and this measurement was done like, so there was light exposure and then there was, this measurement was taken in uh, day 14. Then we run our model. So the, on the bottom, we have the simulations of our model. In the, in the, the four right uh, pictures is where there's no light damage and the, I'm sorry, the four left pictures is where there's no light damage. And the four right ones is where there's uh, light damage. And in the top ones is where, um, there, where we have the actual RDCBFL present, okay? So we see, and in the bottom here, in the, the, at the very end, we have the average of the data as well as the error bar associated with it. For, uh, and here in the bottom is where we have no, uh, no RDCBFL, but we have light damage for both the rods and the cones. So we do that. And then we ask, well, what are the different stability? What are the different equilibria that are associated with this system? And for this system, we have actually five equilibria. We have one where there's nothing, you know, where, it, where the rods, cone, and retinal pigment epithelium are all zero. And then we have one where we have complete blindness, where we have the rods and the cones zero, but the, the, the trophic uh, pool is still there or the retinal pigment epithelium cells. And then we have uh, one where we have only color vision or light or night vision. In other words, we, in the color vision, we, we only have, we have the rods and the retinal pigment epithelium, but we have, sorry, we, in the color vision, we have the cones and the retinal pigment epithelium, but we don't have any rods. And so, and also in the case that we don't have any of the cones. And then we have a case where we have everything. For the cases where we only have, uh, uh, where we have no cones or no rods or where we have everything, those three cases, we see that either we have that the equilibrium come in pair. So either we have zero or we have two of them. And here where we look is at whether they're stable and they, they exist biologically and that's the, green, the uh, blue dots. And here inside the, uh, this parabolic shape is where they don't exist. And now just outside here and to the left of the red curve, is where they're not biologically relevant. And in this little region that you see here, they're biologically relevant, but they're not stable. And that's for where there is no cones. Here we do the same thing for where there is no rods, right? And then if we use a different set of parameters within the realistic range, we then we get those re regions differently. And then we see that the, the region where they're biologically relevant and they exist becomes uh, sometimes it's a little smaller than before. Again, we're looking at, in here, we're looking at E4, where, is, where there is no rods, and E3, where there is no cones, saying, can we still save sight at that point? And we're looking at the parameters associated with RDCBFL and ROS, right? And ROS is uh, for, the, for, the, for the cones and for the rods as well. So here's for the rods, you know, um, the RDCBL and the associated uh, ROS, and then for the cones, RDCBL, L and then the associated ROS levels. And that's, um, and we have a similar picture for E5, but then we ask what other stable modes are there? And for that, we, uh, we scale to be able to bring uh, things closer in magnitude to each other. For example, if we look here at Z, right? 
T is, in, is about 10 to the fifth, A sub N is about 10 to the negative six, and mu is about uh, 10 to the negative one. So that would be closer to order one. So we do that mainly to bring that because of the different scales of the parameters involved and also the variables. And we see that for the, here we're looking, we, we see that as we, we take different um, B values, we are able to get different uh, limit cycles where everything actually uh, exists. So not, not knowing that one, our next step is, can we uh, do a control on the RDCBFL? Because one of the things that I should go back, one of the things that we saw is that we, when we have these limit cycles for different uh, parameter ranges, we either always have uh, the parameter associated with RDCBFL involved, or we have uh, ROS as well involved, or in some cases we have both the uh, uh, parameters associated with, um, that depend on RDCBFL as well as RDCBF, uh, they are involved. So that asks, can we do treatments with RDCBFL and can we do also combined treatments? So in this, in this uh, work, we looked at doing a treatment with just RDCBFL. You know, so doing a control where we administer just RDCBFL and see if that actually, what are, what are the results that is given? And here the blue is the control curve for the rods, the, 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 um, the red is without control. And we see the same thing for the cones. And we look at also within the data to see where things are. If you look at the data here, the dot, the blue dot and the red dot, that's the average of the data and with the respective uh, arrow bars and the same for the cones. Sorry, but I'm blocking it. So what is the, the work in progress is to uh, finish the control for the RDCBFL and, and then uh, have it ready to get submitted. And also to do a control where we have the dual treatment of RDCBF and RDCBFL. And another uh, thing, another paper that we have submitted for publication is one that looks actually at the at the relate at the uh, model looking at raw at the raw a rod and the RPE uh, cell and the interaction between to look at glucose and the raw glucose of the exchange from the RPE to the ROS and how that plays a, uh, a role in the ecosystem. And then we've also looked at the done further analysis on the cone only model with a reduced um, set of metabolic outputs. So those are that's the work that we've done. And here are some of the, my, uh, here are all my collaborators, I should say. Uh, I, a lot of this work and experimental work has been uh, work done in collaboration with Dr. Terry Levier from the Vision Institute of Paris, which is the largest vision institute in the world. Uh, so there's access to not just um, experimental work done in mouse, but there's also certain clinical studies that are done in humans. So that's where we uh, get some of our data and also our guidance. And uh, with my collaborators from ASU, in, uh, including my colleague, uh, Stephen Workers, and my who happens to be also my husband, and then uh, my uh, postdoc and my graduate student, as well as uh, my, uh, a previous graduate student who's now a postdoc in NITS, and then a collaborator in uh, ANCA, and then many other collaborators that have, that have worked in multiple aspects with me. And these are the reference. And thank you very much. And uh, I will unmute to clap for all of us. Um, any questions? So maybe I, I can kick one off, which is uh, so I, I don't completely understand the role of uh, space in all of this. So the, the, all of the models you showed were ODE models. Um, but you know, from what I know, the, the rods and cones are certainly not uniformly distributed. Uh, right. So, so for, for the great question, uh, David, for the, so all the data that we're using is a mouse or, or rat data, right? And for the, for the, for the mouse retina, they are uh, pretty much uh, kind of uniformly distributed, the rods and the cones. For the human, they are not. For the human, definitely uh, the spatial aspect is very important. However, for the human, um, there's very little data to use to, to really be able to uh, quantify the parameters and to, be able to validate the model. So it, it really limits what one can do in that aspect. And that's definitely something that we hope to do as uh, 
the different te technologies that measure things in human could be done. Because even for the mouse, the way the measurements are done is by sacrificing the mice at certain uh, time points. I had no idea that uh, mice had such different visual systems. Are there are there animal models that have visual systems closer to humans? Well, there is the there is the pig, right? The pigs do. But then again, what is the expense of sac sacrificing the pigs, right? And the, so they do. But most of the experiments are done in the mouse and zebra fish. And in, in terms of in the but the zebra, you know, the, the mouse, the the nice thing is the distribution. I mean, in terms of the how many rods versus how many cones they have is similar to the to that in humans, as well as the um, some of the metabolic processes are similar, very similar. Mm -hmm. But uh, the pig, the pigs are another one. It's just that it comes. What is the cost, right, of being able to get that data? And there has been uh, work to, being done right now with RDCVF and pigs. And uh, my uh, my collaborator, collaborator Ter Terry Levier, actually has a collaborator here in the U.S. that is doing those kind of experiments. But those ones are actually longer as well. Other questions. Peter. Um, so that makes me curious, how effective are um, your conclusions for um, keeping humans healthy then? So if, if you know there's a distinct difference, then what can you actually say about trying to prevent blindness in humans? Well, the thing is that with, with this kind of model, right, we were able to discover different pathways that had that been discovered before. Uh, because for example, uh, let me go back, right? One of our models. Right. That, that, that is a very interesting. When I started working with Terry Levier, he didn't really understand the value that I would bring, right? And he even said that he came to give a talk at um, USC. And in his talk, he said, I never really understand the, the value. Like I initially said, I didn't understand the value of mathematics. But then after working with Erica, we, there was a time where we were discussing some simulations and she said, this is exactly what I got. And it's not what, it, what you're saying happens. And this, because of this and this other factor and here in our model. So in this model, we got certain results, right? And I said, and I said that's exactly what they're giving me. This, in terms of the uh, F16 bisphosphate, that's what we get, right? And he said, well, are you sure you use this kind of, this parameter you use? And I said, we use that, we use this, and this is what we get. So it turns out that there's something happening in here, right? Uh, that I could, uh, currently I cannot disclose, right? That in this area, that actually leads to uh, certain mechanisms, right? That alter certain things. And it was because of our discussion and going back and forth and um, me saying, well, we need this other component, right? And he said, I went to the lab and you were right, Erica. We tested it and it's there. So, so that, and of course, the, 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 I think the value comes in that because of the mice lifespan and because of the ability to be able to test things in a cost efficient way, we could go test it right away. And then from there, then a protocol after many tests, making sure that it works and under what condition it works and the, and the toxicity is kept under control, right? If you're gonna do some kind of a chemical kind of uh, injection or something, and when are you gonna give it? Then you go ahead and start the human trials, but it's a whole process. So yeah, this is at the beginning stage, but even finding those certain uh, chemical reactions and processes and identifying and identifying how they play a role is where, it, where I come in. So it's not a, it's not, once you apply it to human, it's more of the tail end of things. So. So Richard and then John. Erica, when, when you were um, in graduate school, uh, we worked with Professor Howland in the um, biology department. And um, we, in fact, we took his course. He had an entire course in the retina. And um, uh, my question, uh, is uh, what is the um, current nature of your interaction with various biologists? I think you were just talking about it, but uh, perhaps you could give some more detail as to uh, who these people are and how you interact with them. So I currently interact a lot, uh, like most of my interaction is like with uh, Terry Levier and his team. So he's a director of the uh, uh, of uh, the biochemistry center of the uh, in the Vision Institute, so he has a whole team of researchers, right? Uh, biologists, biologists, and experimentalists doing the work, and so I interact with them, and then I also interact with I have interact with um, Claudio Punzo, who is actually a biologist and experimental has done experimental work. He uh, he's a student of Nancy 
Tsapka, which is also uh, one of the big people known in, uh, in terms of Ragnaris pigmentosa and some of this work. I have not worked with her though, but I work with him. And uh, so those are uh, those are the, the two uh, people that I work. One of the things that I realized, and those two teams actually are in competition. So I started to work less with, uh, with, um, with Claudio and more with, with Terry Levier, right? Uh, because uh, in terms of what are the, when things come out, for example, like I said, that we're doing a other work with Terry Levier, but we, we have a memorandum of understanding and I cannot disclose it until he discloses what happens uh, experimentally first. So, um, which, is a, which is a drawback, but then the access to have to uh, direct connection to the, to the experimental work and to be able to say, can you go test this? And he'll go and do it and come back. And, and that is really something that I think uh, I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have that kind of interaction. One of the things that he does wants me to do is to go to the lab because sometimes he says that I ask for things and I want them now and, and it's not gonna happen. And then sometimes he comes back with three points. And I said, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I mean, how am I gonna validate this with three points? You know? so, uh, so one of the things that I'm thinking about is uh, potentially doing a Fulbright and going over there. Because uh, he says that I really need to be there. Because sometimes if you ask for things that we can, we cannot get to you, Erica, not like that. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm gonna have to wait for another month to test that. <laughs> That's, um, that's quite interesting, and I think it's very interesting for um, the students in the Applied Math Center to know that um, you actually interact with biologists in this work. Um, thank you. No, it's very, it's very, it's essential, like I said, so I'm hoping to do it, and I, I, am, I think it's going to be a steep learning curve, because I haven't been in a lab in a long time since undergraduate, but I, I welcome the opportunity when he said that, I said, I will start to look into that. <laughs> and see how it goes. So um, my question, Erica, is do you have any insights on the effect of aging? Oh, wow. Uh, yes, one of the big things, well, in terms of the aging with the process, you're gonna have a big accumulation of reactive oscillated species, right? And, and also at that same point, so that's one of the reasons why a lot of the visions start to really deteriorate, right? Because the mechanisms in place are not ready to uh, combat that. So what can be done? Can we have some synthetic kind of thing that is going on or some kind of, that will allow us to combat reactive after the species and also combat uh, hypoxia as we start to see more of our photoreceptors dying as we get older, right? So those are the, those are the, so definitely that's one of the things that really affects vision because of the, like I said, just the, the buildup in, in, the, in, the, in the, the fact that mechanisms start to get overwork and they're not able to also, all the defense mechanisms that exist start to break down. They cannot continue to do it. Yeah, we, we always hear about the uh, importance of exercise um, as one gets older and, and uh, physical activity. Uh, is there anything comparable with vision? Are there exercises that one can do that uh, promote keeping your eyes healthy? I guess I mean you could you could you could do in terms of your muscles to be able to kind of uh, have a better kind of a uh, you know uh, certain reflective errors or, or think have a better kind of um, being able to be but in terms of the generation of photoreceptors not that I know of and but one of the things and, and this is something you remind me of something very important John is that um, with this kind of work what one of the things that it gives uh, insight is, is to uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. so, uh, like um, my, uh, Terry said, I cannot reveal that to you, Erica, because he said, but honestly, some of the work that we're doing, we might actually be getting into something with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I said, I didn't realize how much, how competitive things were in experimental world, right? Because with mathematicians, we don't, but he said, if someone has a bigger lab and has already the line ready to take it, test it, and he said it has happened to him, he said, you know, if I reveal and then you go and give a hint in a talk or something and they heard it and they know how, they understand because they have the background and they've been doing that work. In a matter of a month, they could actually uh, walk out with something that we have been working for years on. Yeah. So that's why he's very much like that. Thank you. Steve. Thank you for that really interesting talk. So yeah, I mean, these remarks you're making right now are especially interesting about the culture of biology um, because unless you've experienced that, like you now have by working with these collaborators, it's kind of hard for us in math to imagine 
what it's really like. So my question is, um, if you were giving advice to our postdocs, our grad students, maybe even to fellow faculty, uh, when you think about your own education, do you have advice like to your old self? Should you have taken more computer science? Maybe you should have taken more biology, more pure math. <laughs> any, any thoughts about that kind of thing? The, uh, excellent question. Uh, I think if I could go back, I would have taken more computer science courses because especially as the data comes in more uh, massive, right? And also not only that, uh, the systems that you have to analyze are more complicated, right? So definitely more computer science courses. I would have taken some statistic courses just or probability courses just to understand more that uh, and how to do certain things, you know? And uh, I would have taken a lab, a few lab courses just lab courses to understand, for example, what is really feasible to measure in the lab? <laughs> and if, if that cannot be measured, what other practice can, proxy things can we use, right? Because sometimes I will ask my collaborator, can, can you get me this values or values for this? And he'll come back, no. And then I have to think, well, because he said, well, something else, Erica, something that, we, so then I have to think what things can we use as proxies, right? That will make sense and will still give a, a realistic value and would be, that is not this, that, we have a model, which is definitely, it's kind of like testing something in a vacuum, right? But there's certain realistic aspects of it and they're really gonna give some insight that is valuable. So I would say I would like to go in back and take a few lab courses that I never took. So thanks Erica and thanks everybody for a lively Q&A.